All right. Today I'm going to give a brief introduction to cryptanalysis, show you some real world uh, examples. Then I will talk about exhaustive search and the big one notation. So let's start with uh, and remember the definitions. You know, cryptology is about is the art and it is about secure communication in an insecure channel, if you want to give a short definition. But actually, you know, uh, it covers a lot of different areas today. You know, from post-quantum cryptography to zero-knowledge protocols, it covers homomorphic encryption, randomness, it has a lot of topics. The cryptography words, the term is about designing secure crypto systems. And cryptanalysis is about analyzing or breaking them. So this is what this course is all about. We are going to try to analyze and break crypto systems. So as you can see, cryptography and cryptology were used as different uh, terms in the past. But today, the words cryptology and cryptography are used interchangeably. So I already mentioned before that cryptography solved a lot of problems. First of all, it solves the problem of confidentiality. So we can uh, provide privacy of stored or transmitted data, messages and conversations. We also provide integrity for stored or uh, you know, transmitted data, messages and uh, conversations. We solve the user and data authentication, transaction non-repudiation. So last time I didn't show this uh, picture, but now let's look at this picture with the previous slide in our mind. So cryptography solves a lot of problems. For instance, for the case of confidentiality, you can use block ciphers, stream ciphers to uh, perform encryption. So in this way, you obtain confidentiality, but you can also use public key encryption algorithms like RSA or Algamo. So cryptanalysis of these different algorithms actually are completely different. But uh, another thing we solve is the data authentication. So you can use hash function here. So you provide integrity in other sense. But we can use message authentication codes or authenticated encryption algorithms. For the entity authentication, you can use zero knowledge proofs, again, message authentication codes or digital signatures. And for origin non repudiation, we can use digital signatures. So these are very different type of algorithms. And the cryptanalysis are somewhat completely different, but uh, you know some basic ideas sometimes apply. For instance, in the case of differential cryptanalysis, our, our aim is to make a small modification in the input and statistically try to observe the uh, effect on the output. So you can apply this idea to many different algorithms. But of course, uh, cryptanalysis of a block cipher is completely different than cryptanalysis of RSA algorithm and so on. So let's recall, plain text is what we want to protect. A crypto system is a pair of algorithms that convert plain text to ciphertext and back. And ciphertext is the encrypted version of the plain text. And ciphertext should appear like a random sequence. So you have the plain text, you convert it into ciphertext using a secret key. Then send it to the person you want to communicate. They have the same secret key so they can decrypt it and obtain the plain text. So this is what a cipher for a crypto system is defined. So now let's look at historical ciphers. They are mostly pen and paper methods. The secret key and the crypto system should be easy to use in practice because you don't have computers, you don't have machines in the past, you have to use pen and paper. So they have to be really easy to use to be used in practice. So they are mostly based on letter substitutions. Most of the time, empty spaces and punctuation marks are removed from the cipher text to avoid information leakage. So let's look at the uh, most famous example, the Caesar cipher. So every letter is replaced by a letter for uh, some fixed number of positions k down the alphabet. And it is used in ancient Rome by Julius Caesar, who supposedly invented it, but any you know elementary school kid should most probably also can probably uh, discover it too. So here's an example with the English alphabet. So I write my plain text as here, cybersecurity, and I choose my secret key equals to two. So there are 26 letters in the English alphabet. You can choose something between one to 25. So when I choose two, I replace every letter with two down in the alphabet. So, but of course we think this as a circular uh, alphabet. So when you want to go two back B, you know, one back B is one down is A. 
So there is nothing before A, so we go to Z, and so on. So the person who receives the cipher text knows the secret key equals to two. So he, they, you know, uh, replace every letter two up for the alphabet. So as simple as that. So here we can actually, with the simple example, also give some of the definitions. So here are plain text are these letters. And the plain text space is actually, you know, English alphabet starting from A to Z. Cipher text space is identical to plain text space in this example. And key space is the uh, possible keys that you can choose. So here you can choose anything between 1 to 26, but of course, if you choose 26, this means that you will be, you know, placing everything with the itself and so on. But encryption takes the input as the plain text character, secret key, and provides the cipher text. Similarly, decryption takes the cipher text, the secret key, and provides the plain text. Okay. So with these definitions, we are trying to understand the is, uh, importance of the key space size. Okay. So if you look at there are 26 letters, so this is your plain text space, cipher text space, but also your uh, secret key space is 26. So this number, as you can imagine, is something small because key is easy to get, guess because key space is too small. For instance, once you, once you capture the cipher text, you know, if you guess that it might be, you know, generated by Caesar cipher, you can, uh, you know, replace every letter one up the alphabet and check if it turns into something meaningful. If it does not, you know, replace it one up again and again and again. In the worst case scenario, in your 25th trial, you should obtain something intelligible, right? So this is very easy to, this is what is actually called an exhaustive search. So you have the ciphertext, you don't know the secret key, but you try every possible secret key in the key space. So for this reason, key space should be large, okay? But question is how large, because nowadays we have computers. So in the exhaustive search part, I will try to explain what should be the key space size. So for, for instance, in this scenario, we can improve Caesar cipher by increasing the key space. For instance, the basic uh, idea is a fine cipher. In order to increase the key space, we use two numbers, A and B. In the previous one, we used the single uh, secret key K. In this version, we use both A and B as the key and encrypt as follows. Uh, when you have the uh, plain text character, you multiply it with A, then add B, and then uh, calculate it modulo 26. So every letter in the alphabet is represented uh, by the number it is on the alphabet, right? So you look at what the C is in the alphabet. You can start with counting with zero. So A is zero, B is one, and C is two. So what you do is two times three plus one. In this example, I chose A equals to three and B equals to one. So you end up with the number modulo 26. You look at the alphabet and see which character it corresponds to. So this way you encrypted it. As you can see, it is now a little bit more complicated. It is not as easy as the Caesar cipher. You cannot easily uh, decrypt it just by looking at it. Because now the key space is 26 times 26. Because there are 676 possibilities you can choose for the combination of A and B. Right? So encryption is just this, A times P plus B modulo 26. But in order to decrypt it, what you are going to do is as follows. You have the ciphertext C as the character number, integer. You multiply it with the inverse of A. So A inverse is actually the uh, number that makes A, when you multiply this number with A, it turns into one modulo 26. They call that this is what we call a multiplicative inverse. So you multiply C with this number and uh, you subtract it with, again, A inverse multiplied B modulo 26 and obtain P. So this is how decryption works. This is important because once you realize how the decryption works, you also realize that you cannot choose every A and B as the secret key. And it is actually easy to see in this example. Let's see. Let me find a, a strange thing here. If it is, if it is not chosen in a clever way. 
Um, yeah, sorry, this one works, but this, the second one is not. So A can have an inverse, A inverse in Zn. If and only if greatest common divisor of A and N equals to one. So if you go back to our example, A is three, N is 26, and the greatest common divisor of three and 26 is actually one. So this means that A has an inverse in this example, so it works. But what happens if it is not, uh, the greatest common divisor is not one? This means that A doesn't have an inverse. So it should be, not be possible to perform this decryption operation. But this also uh, limits our key space, right? Because now I cannot choose every A. I can only choose A that has an inverse modulo 2 and 6. So uh, you can just check one by one or use uh, Euler's phi function to realize that only 12 numbers have an inverse modulo 2 and 6 because there are only 12 numbers, you know, less than 26, where the greatest common divisor of it with 26 is one. So we started to, with an example where we are increasing the key space, but now we ended up, we thought that we had a very huge key space like 600, but now it has reduced to 312. And actually you cannot choose, if you choose B to equals to 26, it doesn't help you much. So this number is even smaller. So let me show you what happens when you choose an A where there is no inverse. So A, I chose A equals to two. And since N is 26, you know, greatest common divisor of two and 22 is two. So it is not one, so it doesn't have an inverse. So if you encrypt using these values, this is what you get as a ciphertext. But if you look at it, you realize that E is mapped to J and R is also mapped to J. Now, the decrypting person will be having a hard time to go back because they would not know if J is going to R or J is going to E because now we don't have a one-to-one -one onto mapping. Okay, there are collisions. So you might think that this is uh, not that important, but there are even nowadays we observe academic papers where encryption does not work like this. You know, you cannot decrypt back from time to time. Okay. So still key space is really small, 300. So I can give you a lot of different examples to increase key space to a few thousand, ten thousands and millions and so on. But we have a better example where the key space is really large. So let's focus on that. So last time I briefly explained this simple monoalphabetic substitution. Every letter is replaced by a letter. So you write the alphabet. You also write the alphabet just below it, but in a random order of your choosing. So this time, uh, the encryption works like this. You write the plain text. Whenever you see A, you replace it with K in the cipher text. Whenever you observe B, you replace it with U. And the good thing is that the key space is really large. It is, you know, it is very hard to perform an exhaustive search attack on this because once the person captures the cipher text, they have to guess what can be the secret key. So they can try it one by one. But since there are 26 letters, here you can have 26 factorial possibilities, which is this, which is really huge. Even our computers would not be able to perform this many operations in a reasonable time. So increasing the key space is not the only problem this means because we can break the system. So in our previous examples, the problem was that key space was small, so I can perform a brute force attack. Now I came up with a new algorithm, a new cipher, where the key space is really huge, so it is resistant against exhaustive search attacks or brute force attacks. But now there are other weaknesses. Non-generic attacks can break it. So actually, this course will be about uh, you know working on non-generic attacks. So in this case, the weakness is redundancy in the language, and because not every letter appears with the same frequency of other letters. So this is the redundancy in, in the language. So we can count how many times a letter appears and this way we can break uh, the system, which is also known as the frequency analysis method. And this statistical method is really important because modern cryptanalysis techniques are also statistical attacks. So we have to uh, know this frequency analysis to understand the modern ones. So let's recall how it works. So for instance, I wrote a plain text. Now I chose this key. So I replaced my plain text with this 
letters depending on the secret key. So now it is a cipher text like this. So as you can see by looking at it, it doesn't mean anything and it is not easy to understand what is going on. And we remove the punctuation marks and so on. So we cannot understand what are the words and so on. But the frequency analysis works as follows. It was uh, introduced by Alkindi in a, a manuscript deciphering cryptographic messages in the 9th century. A copy of this book is available at, at Top Couple Museum, and there are some, you know, PhD theses uh, they also, which they use the excerpts from this book. You can probably find it on the internet. But if you want, you can go to Top Couple Palace and you know pay some money to have the photocopy of the pages of this book. It is based on the redundancy of the language, this frequency analysis method. And it works like this, and everybody actually should do it. It is a very good exercise. For a given language, find a very long text and count the number of frequencies of every letter. Of course, counting by hand would take a lot of time. You can simply write a programming code or use a software to count all of the letters. So this actually gives you the frequency of letters for that language. So for instance, in English, E is the letter that appears the most. The second place belongs to T and so on. In Turkish, the uh, letter that appears the most is A, and then I think E, and so on. So in French, it's different. So you can do it for every language you prefer. Now, you capture the ciphertext, and if the ciphertext is long enough, the letter, appears, the letter that appears the most in the ciphertext is most probably corresponds to the E in the plain text if it is written in English, right? Because your frequency analysis shows you that E appears the most. So in your ciphertext, if another letter appears the most, then it should belong to E most probably. Of course, this is a statistical approach. Sometimes you may make a mistake. So this is a trial and error method. You continue this way. The letter in the ciphertext with the second most frequency is most probably corresponds to T in the plain text. So after like five or six trials and errors, you can start to see uh, some words are forming. So this way you can easily break the system. So this is very important. So actually you can use this technique in, you know, modern puzzles or video games and so on. So this is a screenshot from the uh, video game, Broken Sword. So as you can see in the game, it says that the note has been written using a substitution cipher. This means that a different symbol has been used to represent each letter of the alphabet. So here you have a, a different alphabet. So your aim is to, for instance, if you think that this one is A, so you choose it from here. Where is it here? Then you press A, so it converts into A. So this way you try to uh, solve it. So you can use a frequency analysis, for instance, here. But of course, uh, in the game, uh, they wanted to make it a little bit easier. So they keep the punctuation marks or uh, spaces so that you know where the word ends and where it starts. As you can see, in this case, if it is in uh, English, then you see a three letter word, you can think that some of them might be the, or if you see two letter words, they can be as, in, on, and that kind of stuff. So with a, a few trial and errors, you can solve it. This is why we remove the empty places in the you know monoalphabetic substitution to make it even harder for the attacker to discover. So if you know this kind of techniques, you can solve out of puzzles in this popular culture, you know, video games and so on.